A suspicious fire swept through an apartment, killing two young women. The cause of the fire and the identity of the victims were unclear. But a closer look at the fire scene revealed something hidden in the ashes. Could gas chromatography, a burned pair of eyeglasses, and a half-smoked cigarette solve the case? in March of 1999. Firefighters in Iowa City rushed to an apartment building engulfed in flames near the University of Iowa campus. District 1, engine 2, you're responding as all sorts of structure fire. We need a second ambulance down there. Three. We have another victim. We will be removing one victim. When they arrived, they had uh, fire blowing out windows and doors of the apartment building. Uh, immediately had... Uh, uh, the opportunity and the necessity to initiate an aggressive fire attack. Just inside the entrance, firefighters found what appeared to be a body. Then in the back bedroom, another gruesome discovery. They were unable to see and so uh, had to use the uh, just feeling their way around the apartment and checking on the bed. They found uh, the second victim. A driver's license found next to one of the bodies belonged to 29-year-old Laura Watson Dalton, a paramedic who had come to Iowa City to visit her cousin. She had really loved the town, and it was St. Patrick's Day, and that was one of her favorite holidays. And I think because it's a college town, sort of um, a great party atmosphere for St. Patrick's Day, she decided to go there and visit friends. The second victim matched the description of a woman who had been reported missing. She was 27-year-old Maria Lehner, an environmental scientist who was in town on a business trip and was staying at a nearby hotel. We were hoping and praying it wasn't her, but back of our minds, we kind of knew it was. They had found her blazer in a parking ramp, and it hadn't been, it hadn't been driven for a while. The apartment was rented to three college students who claimed they were out of town on the night of the fire. The men said they gave no one permission to stay there, and they also denied knowing either Laura Watson or Maria Lehner. At the morgue, the medical examiner found evidence that the women were dead before the fire started. There was no soot in the lungs of either victim, uh, therefore we were able to conclude scientifically that they expired prior to the fire. Yeah, it was evident that they had both been uh, killed by blunt force trauma to the head. Inside the apartment, investigators found a barbell that contained blood and human hair, leading to speculation that this was the murder weapon. They also found a gasoline container. You might find gasoline cans stored, of course, in garage or uh, utility closets, but uh, to find a gasoline can in a hallway of an apartment, uh, I think that's, that would be rather odd. Investigators believed that the fire may have been intentionally set and that clues to the killer's identity could be waiting at the crime scene, hidden in the smoldering ashes. And they also wondered why these two women were in an apartment rented by men they'd never even met. The lack of soot and smoke in the victim's lungs revealed that the two women were killed before the fire started. And when the medical examiner compared the amount of tissue damage between the two victims, he discovered something astonishing. The two victims were killed on different days. 
It is clear that Laura died in the late hours on Wednesday or the early morning hours on Thursday and remained in that apartment where she died and that Maria died late Thursday night or early Friday morning in the same apartment. Laura Watson's friends told police that they last saw her in a local bar on Wednesday night, two nights before the fire. Laura was talking to a man sitting beside her. And someone that you've had a conversation with that's been kind of interesting asks you if you'd like to, you know, go to another party or, or go to another bar. Um, lots of people have, have done that, and, and it's a situation where most of us don't think that we're going to place ourselves in peril. Witnesses said Laura left with the man around midnight. He was described as tall in his 20s with unkept brown hair and glasses. Investigators discovered the same thing happened to Maria Lehner on the following night. The owner of a different bar said he saw Maria leaving his establishment with a man matching the same description. She didn't have as good as judgment as she would have if she wasn't drinking. Maybe he said, hey, there's a party over at this place. You want to come with me? I don't think she ever did it before. I think this is one time, and it wasn't, and it was the wrong time. Since the victims had been murdered on two different nights, the killer apparently had free access to the apartment and could come and go as he pleased. But the college students who rented it said they had no idea who the killer was. After the last embers were out, the Iowa Department of Criminal Investigations examined the scene for clues. Investigators noticed a hole in the outside wall of the apartment, and there was a gas container found just inside the front door. To see if an accelerant had been used, Investigators placed some of the debris in an airtight container and sent it to the lab for analysis. Criminalists placed an activated charcoal strip into the can overnight, then washed it with the carbon disulfide. The vials were placed in a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer for analysis. And it will separate it out based on the physical properties and chemical properties of the components of what ignitable liquid may be in that sample. And everything flows through the instrument at a different rate, and it'll actually separate out those, and you'll see the individual components of each component of the ignitable liquid. The results were clear. Gasoline had been used to start the fire. Apparently, the gasoline vapors ignited, causing the explosion that blew through the outside wall. Investigators also discovered a matchbook in the debris. The gasoline had to be ignited by something. And so when the fire marshal collected a matchbook uh, in or around that fire scene that was really a fresh matchbook with only one match missing. The fire had destroyed any prints that might have been on the matchbook. Steve Duffy looked through all of the photos taken at the fire scene, searching for items that may have been overlooked. In one of the photographs, he noticed something that looked like a pair of eyeglasses. When he returned to the apartment, they were still there. They were very obviously prescription eyeglasses, and I hoped that I could go back through those prescriptions to find the owners. None of the tenants or victims owned the glasses. Duffy also found a cigarette butt still very much intact. This cigarette had been smoked, had not been put out, had not been stomped out on the floor. In other words, it was still burning when it hit the carpet. Investigators suspected that the perpetrator lit a cigarette, then started to pour the gasoline throughout the apartment. At some point, his cigarette probably ignited the gases. He received a burn on his nose. He either swatted at his face and knocked his glasses off, or he 
the glasses fell off his face, and the cigarette flew out of his mouth. Now investigators were looking for a tall, unkept man who smoked cigarettes and possibly had a burned face. He may also have been missing his eyeglasses. One week after a fire gutted their apartment, the three college students who rented it were allowed to return. There were items stolen from the apartment that included uh, a VCR or two and some other electronic equipment. Investigators checked local pawn shops to see if someone had sold the stolen goods. And they got their first break. A pawn shop owner recalled buying these items from a young man just a few days earlier. In Iowa, anyone selling to a pawn shop must show some form of identification with an address. The man who sold the items was John Memmer, a 23-year-old drifter known around town as a partier. John Memmer was very adept at inviting himself to those after-hours parties. Uh, because of that, he was a person who could con his way into staying over at any number of apartments and, and sleeping on their couch or what have you. One of the apartment tenants said he knew Memmer and had let him sleep overnight a few weeks earlier. He didn't have a lot of friends, he didn't have a job, he wasn't enrolled as a student. He was sleeping where he could. Um, he was very transient, and yes, that made it more difficult to find him. Mr. Memmer basically made his living by being a thief. Police finally caught up with Memmer, who was on probation at the time for a forgery conviction. When he was questioned, investigators noticed he had a burn injury on his nose. Memmer admitted he had been in the apartment while the tenants were away and also confessed to stealing their stereo and television set, but he denied killing the women or setting the fire. He said there was another drifter sleeping in the apartment that week, too. Police wanted to see if they could tie Memmer to the evidence. Immediately after the fire and explosion, he did not have eyeglasses. And during the following week, he acquired another pair of, of glasses. Using a machine called a lensometer, an optometrist determined the degree of curvature or diopters of the lenses. The strength of the lenses matched the prescription Memmer had been given by his eye doctor. In John Memmer's situation, he needed his eyeglasses to see. He would not leave his eyeglasses laying around. So to find his eyeglasses at the scene of a double homicide and arson was significant. Police needed more proof. They looked once again at the cigarette butt, the one investigator suspected had inadvertently ignited the fire. Was it possible this cigarette butt contained the killer's DNA. Scientists removed the wrapper from the lip end of the cigarette, then separated any cells present in the paper. The biological sample was then reproduced to create a larger sample for analysis, then compared to a DNA sample taken from Memmer while in custody. It was a match. Statistically, the, the chances of the DNA in the cigarette butt coming from anyone but Mr. Memmer are too small to consider. But Memmer admitted being in the apartment, which could account for him leaving his glasses and the cigarette butt. Police needed more proof. Investigators then examined Laura Dalton's leather jacket found in the apartment. Somebody came up and said, you know, while we have this jacket, why don't you go ahead and look at the jacket? Maybe there's a print on a button, a snap or something. Criminalist Bessman checked the jacket under a high intensity light. No prints were found. Then he placed the jacket in a special cabinet with a small container of cyanoacrylate, a compound found in superglue. 
The compound was heated, and the fumes circulated around the jacket for about 10 minutes. The cyanoacrylate has made kind of a little fibrous network over those fumes, and we can look at it, and it makes the ridges stand out white instead of the black like you'd see on an ink fingerprint card. To his surprise, Bessman found a partial image of a foot impression. The print was dyed to fluoresce under forensic lighting. Bessman compared that print to the soles on the shoes confiscated from John Memmer when he was taken into custody. Both prints were the same size and make. There had to have been a contaminant on the shoe or something on the coat that the shoe removed when it made contact with it. So it was uh, rather unusual to develop a footwear impression this way. And there was something else on the shoe a tiny piece of evidence that would tell investigators exactly what happened to Laura Dalton and Maria Lehner. Investigators found one last piece of evidence linking John Memmer to the murders of Laura Watson Dalton and Maria Lehner. It was a tiny piece of material on Memmer's shoes on the side of the sole, about the size of a pinhead, kind of a reddish brown stain that I believe might have been blood. The stain was lifted using sterile water, then tested using DNA analysis. The DNA from the blood on the shoe matched the DNA sample from Maria Lehner. It just made it just more sad because you kind of knew what he had to do to get blood on his shoes. That was critical. It showed that John Memmer had been in contact with Maria Lehner, even though he denied it, and that at some point he was with Maria Lehner when she was bleeding. John Memmer was charged with first-degree murder. We had other forensic evidence, the uh, jacket, the footwear, analysis, the eyeglasses, but it was the DNA analysis that found Maria's blood on Memmer's shoe that was the final uh, straw that let us go forward. Prosecutors believe John Memmer broke into the apartment when he knew the tenants were out of town. How he lured Laura Dalton to the apartment on Wednesday evening isn't clear, but prosecutors believe Memmer may have made a sexual advance which was rejected. In a rage, Memmer killed Laura with a blow to the head. On Thursday night, Memmer probably lured Maria Lehner to the apartment the same way. And when she too rejected him, he killed her as well. On Friday, after stealing the television and stereo, Memmer decided to destroy all possible evidence that he had been there. He lit a single match for his cigarette, then set about the process of pouring gasoline throughout the apartment. But he made a mistake. The gasoline caused fumes to build in the small apartment, and his cigarette caused the explosion. It knocked his glasses off, burned his nose, and the cigarette butt and matches went flying. That was probably John Memmer's downfall, was his smoking the cigarette, because he left behind valuable evidence and nearly killed himself. A waste. He's a waste of a human being. Soulless. Um, I don't think probably ever contributed anything. And as a probably has spent all of his life using people and, and taking. At the trial, it wasn't just the forensic evidence that made an impression on the jury. Memmer was sporting a new tattoo as he sat at the defense table. In the gang world, a tattoo of a teardrop signifies you've murdered someone. In this case, that was significant because John Member did not want one teardrop at the corner of his eye, but he wanted two. 
talk about <laughs> not very smart <laughs> going to the trial with those on his eyes and the jury can see it easily. Uh, when I questioned him about that at trial, he claimed they were for two friends of his that had died in an automobile accident. But uh, I think that was pretty powerful, damning evidence. In truth, in the aggregate, it was a small piece of circumstantial evidence, but uh, it was an interesting addition to the totality of the case. John Memmer was convicted of two counts of first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison. Maria Lehner's family says it's ironic that science helped find her killer. She was a biology major. She loved science. So knowing that the blood on the shoe and all the other forensic evidence was what put him away, I'm sure she would, would have thought that was pretty cool. There is no such thing as a perfect crime. There's always evidence left. It's there for the people who look. This was uh, where the evidence led, and it pointed to Mr. Memmer. He received two life sentences. John Memmer will obviously serve one of his life sentences here uh, on this earth. If I was John Memmer, I would be worrying about where I'm going to spend that second life sentence. It, uh, it may be a lot hotter there than the fire that he started.